Hi, welcome. My name is Brad Brooks and I'm with Speedline Solutions. Today we're going to be talking with Travis Miller and Nico Frangos and going through what I would like to call a restaurant technology roundtable. We'll spend the next hour or so talking about key pieces of restaurant technology, the decision process that different companies use in order to decide on a new solution. And then finally, how leading companies have solved some of their key issues with their technologies. So why don't I just do a start off by doing a quick introduction. Travis, thank you for joining us. You're with Cottage Inn. Why don't you maybe just tell us a little bit about Cottage Inn and, uh, and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thank you for having me, Brad. Um, yeah, so my name again is Travis Miller. I work for Cottage Inn Pizza. I am the director of physical and financial operations for the brand. Um, Cottage Inn is a Midwestern pizza chain that we kind of focus on a gourmet pizza with lots of variety and options in the gourmet pizza sector. Um, we have about 55 locations right now, mostly through Michigan and a couple in um, Ohio. Very good. Now, about yourself, Travis, your position, you're, you're director of, of technical and financial operations at Cottage Inn. What does that mean? What does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis? So yeah, so um, I've been in the pizza industry since I was about 14 years old. Uh, um, I uh, got moved up to management about seven years ago or so, and I started um, with a focus more on accounting and financials um, and ended up working my way up to kind of overseeing the accounting processes um, and systems of the brand. And then we uh, adopted a new uh, point of sale system with Speedline, and there was a we, a need for somebody to kind of be the figure it out guy on that. Um, sure. And that's where I kind of started to move into more of a technical role with the company. And now I'm overseeing pretty much all aspects of the technology involved with the brand. That's very good. Thanks, Travis. Nico, tell us a little bit about Rascal House. So thanks for having me, guys. Um, nice to be with you. Uh, Rascal House is a, it's a 40 year old brand. We've been uh, a Cleveland based brand um, and we have five locations in the surrounding areas. Uh, we have just laid the foundation right now for a franchise program. So I'm heading that part of it up. Um, but essentially we are a elevated quick serve uh, that has a pizza center. So again, simplified menu offering um, burgers, fries, milkshakes, uh, pizza, of course. Uh, and we take that sort of simplified menu, deliver it out uh, much like a typical pizza place would with a real heavy also uh, focus in catering. So, um, you know, excited to be, be here with you guys and uh, share what I can. Yeah, Nico, what was your journey to where you are now? Uh, that's a really, really long story, but I'm gonna make it super short. Uh, my parents founded the company. Um, so, so by virtue of that connection, uh, it, you know, it's a simple story there. Um, but I, I moved to Los Angeles many moons ago in the ni early 90s, pursued film and art and um, worked in, in film primarily for many years had a connection with, uh, you know, my parents, of course. Um, and as I saw sort of the opportunity that they had developed, uh, you know, I kind of came back full circle and, and wanted to champion the, you know, really packaging of the brand and, and getting the brand to scale. So um, that's my, my, uh, my connection back to back, back from the West Coast, back to the Midwest. Oh, very good. Okay, well, let's jump into it. So let's talk a little bit about what your tech stack looks like uh, in the stores. So Travis, you mentioned you have Speedline in the stores. What other technologies do you have in the stores besides your point of sale system? Uh, so for at store level, um, we do use Zenput a little bit, which is um, kind of like a reporting um, and auditing and compliance kind of program. Um, our franchise consultants use that to uh, do uh, site surveys. Um, outside of that, I think one of the important ones for us is our, actually our phone system. Um, okay. We have a 4G LTE failover on most of our stores. Um, so for online ordering connections, credit card processing and voice service, that's all backed up um, with caller ID um, and live maps is I know part of Speedline, but definitely a huge part of our tech stack in the store level. Right, and, and for those that don't know what live maps is, maybe you, if you could explain that. Yeah, so Live Maps takes all the deliveries that are coming into the feed line system and um, maps them for you so you can do multiple delivery zones or different delivery fees. Um, all the stores that we have it deployed in use a secondary monitor, typically a TV that's mounted near like an expo area uh, that shows all of the deliveries that are kind of pending or on hold um, where they're located. And it's definitely a huge help, I think, mostly for 
managers who are working at like a cut table area or an expo section. It's very quick visual to look up in the corner of the restaurant and see, all right, driver one, take the two that are north, driver two, take the two that are south. Um, and that's a very uh, helpful piece to that puzzle. Sure, that's great. Nico, tell us about your operations. What does it look like in store? Um, in store, uh, it, again, Speedline is sort of the foundational piece. Um, we do have a, a program called Jolt that we've connected with, which is a training, onboarding, orientation, uh, checklists, things like that. So it's a platform that uh, really crew member facing um, primarily uh, and some scheduling also connected to that piece. Um, we also have a, a piece called I guess this isn't specific to operations per se, but it is connected to our operational piece, which is the hiring, which is through a company called Workstream. So we started a relationship with them. Uh, it's a pretty good platform uh, just to streamline the multiple people that need to touch, uh, you know, hires, um, you know, uh, so that, that's been a good platform. Um, to really kind of go down the whole list too uh, quickly would be even Chowley. We have that as a third party connectivity piece. Right. Um, or checkmate, you know, where we're looking at both of those. Uh, we right. have, uh, we have so the that takes your, just So that, that'll take your third party orders from DoorDash and Uber Eats and so forth, put it directly into your point of sale system? Correctly, so it's, a, it's that, that consolidator, um, okay. instead of having all the multiple tablets. Um, and then uh, again, just uh, lightly, it's, you know, the office suite, all of our locations work off of office suite and the, the, the cloud for OneDrive, again, to have sort of their buckets for each store and the things, the files that they need to work off of. Um, and then we do use Zoom and some things like that, too, at the store level. So, I mean, if, to kind of go through our whole stack, if you will, that, that'd probably be the, the big high-level ones, uh, you know, that I think are core right now to what we're doing. Are either of you using anything for marketing automation? Emails uh, that you send, communication, SMS to any, any customers? Yeah, so um, go, ahead, go, ahead, Travis. go ahead, Travis. Go ahead, Travis, and then. All right. Um, yeah, so we have a, a text marketing program through uh, Mobility um, that does like automated messaging uh, to select stores for select offers. Um, email marketing, uh, we're using Constant Contact right now. Um, but yes, those are automated uh, messaging. Um, outside, okay. outside for automated. Go, go ahead, Nico. Let me think a little bit more on that. Yeah, um, at the store level, we don't really have any of our team members needing to interact with any technology that is, uh, you know, um, in other words, they don't have to administer to it. They, they, we do have a text platform. Uh, I think it's called Boostly, if I remember right. Um, and then we also use MailChimp as our mail platform. And then we have some stuff that uh, uh, also integrates with our, our Facebook and all the social stuff that we do. So there's, there's that ecosystem there, but again, Store level wise, those guys don't really interact with it uh, on the administrative standpoint. They're really just, you know, they're aware of the, the promotions, they're aware of the, the stuff that's going on. They push people to, to adopt and sign up for text messaging and things like that, but they're not really in charge of those platforms. That's more um, corporate level uh, that we manage that. I get asked this question a lot by people. What, what food cost system are you using? Are you using one that's integrated with point of sale or using one that that's outside of that or nothing at all? Uh, for for us, for us, Go we're, ahead, we're adopting the speed line um, piece. So we've done it sort of old school at the other operations that we have, but we're, we're onboarding a, a real robust version of uh, food costing in the POS through speed line right now. Okay. Travis, what about you? Yeah. So for us, um, we're, we're still doing, uh, quite a manual process, I, I would say. I think the challenge in the industry um, is getting staff to make proper counts and proper receives for food ordering. Uh, that's a challenge in the Speedline system and any system, um, yeah. any form of inventory management. Um, if you're, especially when our, our menu is quite large. So um, to count all of those SKUs accurately with weights or portions or whatever it might be um, and get an accurate look at that um, sometimes it's difficult to get it from that store level feedback. So I think the approach there is definitely still taking full inventories, but uh, to do, you know, maybe the key items more frequently, uh, you know, on a daily or weekly basis and take that full inventory more on a period basis. But um, still, still out there shopping for like the perfect solution. The for perfect solution, yeah. 
Well, I've had a long history. So before I before I, I crossed over to the dark side on the on the sales side of point of sale, I was uh, director of technology for a 50 unit chain. So I have some some experience in this, and I actually built some food costing systems. And I tell people I built four, and the reason I built four is because the first three were terrible. So uh, I, I understand a little bit about the challenge that you go through with that. I think I'm always surprised when I find that there are a lot of companies of substantial size that don't have food costing in place. Um, and, uh, and because of some of the specific challenges that you mentioned there, Travis, that's, uh, that's good insight. Let's uh, maybe shift the conversation a little bit and talk a little bit about what happens when you're looking at new, at new uh, software. Uh, Travis, let's start off with you. Who do you go to? Who in your, on your team provides input into, into technology solutions? Is it at the C-suite talking to, with the, the CEO and president, or are you talking with, with the, right down at the, at the store level? Yeah, so I think this is an interesting question because for me, I, I feel that most often it's someone else from a different department coming to me. I have this problem and I need a solution for it. Let, let's find like Zenput, for example, you know, we were making these um, audit uh, questionnaires and for store site visits. And, you know, I was watching people make these, you know, spreadsheets to print out like a fillable handwritten form and, you know, hey, is there an easier way to do this? How do we, can we find this quicker? Um, so that that's one part of the solutions where, where people are coming to me looking for things. But when I look for something new in the tech space, I'm looking to solve typically other people's problems. And I'm seeing how it needs to interact with operations, how it needs to interact with marketing. Um, you know, our franchisees are someone to definitely can to consider as far as pricing is concerned. Um, you know, budgets as, as to, it, does it fit in the budget? But um, I think one of the most important parts of all of that is like that end user adoption and making sure that it's something that solves the problem completely and is right. not just kind of like part of it or doesn't overlap with some other solution that's in place. And then once it's deployed, getting everybody to adopt it to get the maximum value out of that typically software as a service or what have you. So how about you, Nico? What 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 type of input do you take from your team? You've got a smaller team, so it's a slightly different situation. Yeah, it's a little different. Um, generally we tend to be more proactive on our sweet C suite, if you will, um, about trying to find new technologies, trying to you know, stay in contact with our franchise guys and uh, even our operate operations team and saying what what are the pain points? Um, and and because we know that those guys are busy too, they're not always sitting around looking for things. So we take that responsibility on uh, at the corporate level in a lot of ways. Kind of go, what you know, what things can we improve on? How do we reduce costs? Uh, what platforms you know are getting some traction or that we're hearing other brands use successfully? So that that tends to be our process. It's to really kind of stay open to the noise, if you will, uh, around. Um, either pain point or new technologies that are effective. And then we'll kind of, you know, our, our, our real funnel of that process starts to be that we'll, you know, have those conversations. We start looking and, and vetting, um, vetting them out and, and looking at technology, but fundamentally it starts there. That's kind of where we, we start, you know, we start by getting their input and, and then also being very aggressive about like, how do we improve as we want to scale. Yeah. Uh, one of the, one of the struggles that I ran into fairly frequently was, I would have someone come and they, they would have a preconceived notion of what that solution should look like. They would say, I need to get product X. And then we'd get into it and say, well, why do you need that? And what will that do for you? And how will you know that's successful? And will people actually use this? And by the time you get into it, you realize, okay, the product X might not actually be the right solution, but there's definitely a real problem there and pushing off of that solution just for a half second. So we can at least explore other, other possibilities seem to be really helpful for uh, in that decision-making process. I'm seeing nodding, so I, I assume that that's something you run into as well. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. It's definitely important to really identify what the core issue is that you're trying to solve before you hop in, because uh, you know, me being sort of a visionary creative type for the brand, and you know, I, I like shiny new things, you know, um, and I'll chase, chase the squirrel once in a while. So it's good to have the team kind of bring me back a little bit, uh, you know, but, but to your point, 
we definitely want to, you know, when we get into these conversations, like, what are we trying to solve? Let's be very, very specific about why are we, why, why are we doing it? And how does that fit into our, our needs right now, our priorities to kind of vet, vet those uh, new things that we want to chase that rabbit right now or not. Travis, is, is there a disciplined approach around getting return on investment when you look at new solutions or is it more just sort of a gut feel? I think this will work. Uh, um, there, in some cases, there's a return on investment consideration, um, but I, I, to kind of to add to what Nico was saying, um, you know, really sitting down and having an understanding of what it is you're trying to solve, sometimes before you even go shopping, sometimes, sometimes there's situations where things pop up that you explore and, you know, okay, that gives you the idea we need to find something that kind of solves this, this problem we have, but if you already know you have the issue, it's really good to kind of sit down and have a good understanding of, you know, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Because once you get started exploring, you, you kind of get sucked into that sales funnel and like, oh, this is going to be perfect. It's going to solve all of our, all of our problems and worries. And especially when it creeps out of the technology department and into uh, upper management, and, you know, or, or one person that they think might, it might benefit the most. Um, it kind of strays away from the the real problem at hand, and right. uh, sometimes we just get kind of sold on these concepts that really might not really hit every checkbox we need to hit. Let's talk a little bit about what that planning looks like, because as I as I think about it, it's a good natural segue to this. What you just said there, a lot of times I'll see people come out and they'll say, "I want to do an RFP." And so they'll start that RFP process. Um, if you don't start with a specific product in mind, you end up with a laundry list of all of the things I'd like to do sometime. You know, well, you never know. We may open up a pizza place on the moon, so everything should have rocket ships attached to it, right? Like that kind of idea. Or you end up with something that is, uh, that is not sufficient in order to make an actual evaluation, and you end up missing critical core pieces of that technology. So... Do you, do you do RFPs, Travis, in your organization? We do for uh, larger, larger projects. Um, so for example, uh, we work with an outside firm for website development. That's right. a large overhaul project that requires a lot of check boxes and you're really vetting the vendor when you make that selection. So for those kinds of things, absolutely. Um, for, for smaller solutions, not necessarily. Right. So, how about yeah. you, Nico? Have you have you participated in RFP? Um, yeah, to some degree. Uh, with uh, it echo what what Travis said in a lot of ways. Depends on the scope of the project and how big it is. Um, you know, if it's like again redoing our whole website, we went through that whole process, right? A lot of a lot of check boxes, a lot of vetting, a lot of uh, contacting references. What was the process like? You know, looking at that whole before we got into the weeds, because like like even you said a minute ago it's very easy to get sort of into that sales funnel and everything's magical, you know, everything's a solution and it works great. And, you know, uh, until you're like so far in, you've, you've cut the check and you're kind of going and go, wait a minute, this is, you know, wait, wait, this, this, I didn't think to ask this question, you know, right. now we're here. So, um, so yeah, we, we do on uh, those big scale projects, but for the little stuff, you know, mostly all that, those questions and answers, again, go back to really what I said a second ago, we, we get very clear as a team, what our real priorities are. We have a, a cadence that we kind of fall into quarter to K, what are the big issues? Which ones can we tackle? Um, just to kind of be really crystal clear as a group and then and then we'll vet it all out, you know, whatever we feel is the highest level pain point um, and put that in the priority scope and, and push it through. Uh, our whole team looks at it and decides and then we go, go through those processes. So Nico, when you make those decisions, does that do, does the decision and the the decision to move forward, does that budget just lie within the executive team because of the size of your organization, or does yeah. it get delegated? Okay. No, it pretty much we we approve from here. You know, because of this this we're we're not so huge. We have a leadership team, our senior leadership team. We get together weekly. You know, um, and we we are pretty deliberate about our meetings. And, um, you know, this would fall into that. So we'll, finance would be there. We talk about the budget implication or any other large scale costs. We would kind of get into who needs to do what in this process. Is it going to impact, you know, if it's a financial thing, like a QuickBooks product or something, you know, that operations can ultimately use. Well, what, what does each department have to worry about? What's their role? And can they take it on? You know, I mean, if we, if everybody's 
guns blazing to, to wrap up our, our quarterly uh, initiatives, you know, then we, we, we got, we, we got to get clear about what, what everybody's role is. And so we, we're pretty deliberate about kind of how we will take something and move it and then decide that, yes, we're doing it. And here's, here's the start time. It sounds like you have a, a lot of discipline in your organization, Nico, just the way you talk about like the, the weekly meetings you have with your management team, the level of, de the level of deliberate action that you take. Is that is that a fair thing to fair comment to make? Uh, yeah, and and I would say it's uh, maybe this is helpful to somebody that's listening. We we've onboarded um, a, an operating system for our company, the foundation that our business runs on is called EOS, um, and it's uh, entrepreneurial operating system. But it's very deliberate about your business cadence, your you know how you operate as a team, the tools that you use, uh, and we follow that structure and we found it to be very very helpful. I mean, there's there's probably a dozen different platforms that a company could adopt. Right. Um, we just were led to that one and, and vetted it out and were, were felt that it was the right fit for us. So we, we've implemented that. And, and that's really the, 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 that's really where our discipline sort of springs from is just, uh, you know, kind of following those disciplines. Just to put this in perspective, that vetting of the, the website creator that, or, or when you had your website redone and, and the designer and, and agency that did your website, how long did that process take to decide from the time you said we're shopping till, till you decided that you were going to go with a certain vendor? Uh, honestly, I'm going to say it, it was the better part of, I mean, from the minute we decided that, yes, we're going to do this and yes, we have a sense for what the costs would be. Uh, and in terms of what we felt we needed to spend from talking to a handful of people from that point, that really started our, our vetting process. Like now right. let's get, you know, is this a hundred thousand dollar project or is it a $5,000 project? So I mean, we had to kind of start with that before yep. we figured it out. But I honestly would say it really probably took us the better part of three months, two, two months at the very least. Um, you know, I was, I was connected to it, but that was more of our, um, you know, brand um, and, and marketing department really took that on. So um, again, I was there to support that decision and kind of move it through and ask good questions, but they kind of took it, but I'm going to say about two months, really okay. to kind of go from here to there and pick a winner. Travis, for comparison, you went through a similar project. How long did that project take you? I, I'd say we were probably about on par with that, maybe a little bit longer, actually, probably three to, three to five months, um, somewhere in there. Um, I find that the larger the organization, the, the, the more people you need to bring on board uh, in that decision-making process. And then just even just the logistics of aligning up schedules can be, can, can create some complexity. Do you hold the purse strings for IT in your organization or is that shared amongst you and operations and finance? Um, so a lot of the decisions, especially related to hardware are pretty much my call, I would say. Yeah. Um, when, when something's at end of life and needs to be replaced, it's kind of my decision without really needing to seek any higher level to replace it or take care of it. Sure. Um, when it comes to like a new solution or an ongoing cost, that's where it starts to dabble into meeting to get with the team to discuss it. Um, what, what I find a lot too is I think when you talk about that time is that somebody in one department, like maybe somebody in marketing really pushes the initiative to rebrand the website or rebuild it to make it easier for a customer experience perspective. Um, they kind of start that push, they get with me now we're kind of aligned in our browsing and we come down to a final selection or three and we kind of take it to management and say, hey, you know, we're really serious about this. This is the work we've done to find it. I take it to ownership for, you know, really seeking approval for that spend because, you know, those are larger um, scale projects and require a little bit more um, participation from the organization and say. Sure. Well, what role do your franchisees play, Travis, in that in that decision making process? Do you have a committee or a group that you typically bring in? Uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll um, share uh, new ideas with you know a select few um, of, of the franchisees. Uh, a lot of that comes down to communication too. Sometimes it's something that we feel will benefit everybody, and you know we can have those conversations with a couple of our franchisees to get their opinion on it. Um, but we really want to kind of unify everybody in that process as well and say. You know, okay, we found a solution that we think is going to solve X, Y, and Z for you. Um, it's going to cost you this, but your return on investment is this. It's a lot more about communication when you're in, involving the franchise, commu uh, franchise community in those new solutions. Um, because a lot of them are reluctant to, you know, spend much. Uh, but if you can 
give them examples as to the work you've put in to um, show that it's going to benefit them in some way and that there's going to be a return and it's going to help them in the brand as a whole, then it's a lot more easy to get them on board. I think we've all developed a pretty healthy skepticism when uh, a vendor comes to us and says, we can increase your sales by X or we can lower your costs by X. There is part of us that, that just says, I don't believe it, right? And, and I recognize this being on both sides of the table where I get products pitched to me. And then when we're pitching a, our, our own product, we're always very careful to, to find people and, and get, an actual, get an actual individual to say it as opposed to us just saying it. And what we found is, uh, and, and this, is, this comes down to sort of shepherding that decision through the, through the organization, the more you can make it feel like the idea is coming from the other person, the better off that you are in terms of getting adoption widespread. And that comes back to your point when you talked about getting the end user adoption, Travis, like that all of it ties together. How you, how you make the decision, uh, the decision process itself can actually impact pretty significantly the level of, of end user adoption because they may not feel like they are fully vested in the solution. They may feel like it's just being pushed on them. Right. Let's, let's shift the conversation a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about, about online ordering and talk about some specific solutions that you both have in your locations. Um, uh, so just to, I'll, I'll, I'll lay out the, the, the groundwork a little bit here. Uh, Nico, you're using Chow now. Travis, you're using RTO. And Speedline has its own uh, Speedline online ordering system that neither of you are using. And that's, that's good. That provides a great sort of basis for conversation here. So let's start with you, Nico. Tell me a little bit about your experience with your online ordering and what you like about it and what you looked for when you chose it. Um, we kind of moved to Chow now, uh, mostly out of a necessity piece, um, not because we didn't have it, but we had, we've actually been dabbling in online ordering and adopted it really, really early. I'm talking about 15 years ago. I mean, okay. you know, it might be that far out that we've had online ordering. Um, one of the biggest things that we we were, we, we liked uh, in some of the earlier solutions was the direct connection to the POS. Order could come in. Um, you could adjust the order if a customer called and said, oh, can I add something? Or, oh, you know what? We you know need to do this. Or that's, can I move for tomorrow? Because we do, we do a heavy amount of catering also. We're in central business districts. We have a lot of customers that need some flexibility. Um, so it's important for us to, to have a tool that worked that way. So, you know, we had another provider. Um, it spoke to the POS directly. Uh, it was a pretty decent solution, but then PCI compliance becomes a factor, what, credit card sure. processing. So as we had to move away from that company, we needed just a stopgap solution. Um, so, so that's why we chose Chow now, because it was fairly quick to onboard um, and we could keep online orders flowing without really much disruption. So since that time, though, we really truly are looking to develop um, a solution that maybe is more brand centric um, and not a out of the box solution. Um, because right. we have some particular things that matter to us. Um, and now that's that's something that's on our radars to, again, maybe move to another provider while we start addressing how big of a project is it to to really take a platform and make it our own and, and do it exactly how we want, which, you know, we're vetting that out. So I, I, I know I'm talking a lot, a lot about the process, but for us, that's where, where we've arrived at Chow now. It's truly a, uh, it's a stopgap in a lot of ways. It, it functions, it's fine, but it's not, it's from the brand standpoint, what we want to present as an online ordering platform. It, it, it's, you know, it's a stopgap. Fair enough. Travis, how about, how about you? You're using RTO. Yeah. So, um, I think online ordering is one of those things that I'm always keeping my eyes open um, with. Um, it, it's probably one of the most important pieces of technology in a pizza store today. Uh, the ticket averages are historically much higher. It's converting to be much, uh, a larger part of our overall um, sales are coming from on, online. So when I talk about this, I there's so many pieces to this puzzle and I'm unwilling to give up any pieces I already have. Right. Um, so when, when you go to vet a new online ordering system, you're talking about the order flow, you're talking about 
A big piece for me, um, and which might be a contrast to Nico, is we, we do many management for all of our franchisees. So when it comes to the online ordering um, piece, I have an internal team that is managing most of the item and coupon creation themselves and um, doing that by store groupings. Um, the way we want to create coupons is a complex thing to discuss when you're dealing with an online ordering provider because um, you know, we want to be able to do the same things we can do in Speedline, or maybe we want to be able to do different things on the online ordering side for only, only offers. Um, the way uh, coupons can be redeemed, driving people to specials pages, dropping coupon codes in their cart from a marketing perspective, um, user experience. So there's just so many different things that need to all come together for that solution to fit. Um, and that's why it's not something that is like really taken lightly in my mind is you know, we have to have a lot of check boxes checked. Um, maybe some of them are negotiable, but most of them that exist today are not. But there are definitely things that we are looking for. Um, being able to modify quoted times within Speedline and having that, um, you know, push to the online ordering side. Um, payment, integrated payments, integrated gift, all of that stuff. Being able to add something at the counter an upsell at the counter to an online ordering customer who's coming in for pickup is a huge thing. So all without, of the- Without things, having to ask for payment yet again. Right, rather than having to ask for payment yet again. Yeah. Um, it makes that, that upsell a little bit harder. Um, from the accounting perspective as well, you know, batching, batching out those online orders that are not integrated and reconciling that to what was received in the point of sale as kind of like marked as an accounts receivable that's an admin process that takes a lot to kind of manage as well. So um, with all those things, it's something that I'm constantly keeping an eye on and looking out to see, you know, what's evolving, what's changing. Um, but all those things together um, across departments um, need to kind of agree that that's the best solution. And I think when you go down that road, you have to kind of pilot it at a location. Uh, you definitely for us would need to pilot it at one to see how it goes. And then probably two or three to be able to really explore the, the store grouping management functions of being able to say this coupon code is available here and here, or one of my favorites, this pop flavor uh, is available here, here, and here. And they they all maybe sell one outside of the base, you know, Pepsi and um, you know Diet Pepsi or whatever. Maybe they sell, yeah, you understand. So yeah. The special flavor of Mountain Dew is the one that I run into. There you go. Code Red. I'm right, right. With, I'm right with all those comments, Travis. Uh, and that, that's why we haven't, you know, to, to, to the point of Chow Now, we've been so deliberate about what we really need out of the platform that we have literally been months and months kind of talking to all the options, talking to one options that are not really obvious options and seeing if they can do what we want them to do. It's a humongous uh, piece, you know, and such a critical one. For so all I'm going to say something. I'll, I'll say something. It'll sell self-serving when I say this, but I, I don't mean it to. I think that there's really three three key things that are key offerings that a, a point of sale provider should offer. They should offer their own integrated online ordering for someone that wants to do a one-stop shop and have that single point of contact. They should also offer, uh, like uh, like both of you are using third-party integrations that, that provide choice and options for them. Because knowing that nobody does everything perfectly, right? And there might be something that's specific. But the last choice is they should also provide an open API that allows you to, to uh, integrate your own system. So you think about your, what you're doing there, Nico. If you're able to then uh, use an API in order to create exactly the experience you're trying to create for your customers. Those three things are, th those three pieces are critical. So um, of course, naturally we offer those, but that wasn't the point of that conversation. The point was just to show that there are so many different ways. And with 70% of transactions or an estimated 70% of transactions being sourced digitally now, it is critical that you get that digital experience right. Because in many cases between that and the delivery driver, that's what they know about you. Yeah. All right, let's, uh, let's jump into talking about delivery itself because uh, that's such an important piece. So you've, you talked originally uh, or earlier on, uh, Travis, about live maps and what that does for you. 
Um, Nico, maybe over to you. What, what solutions do you have in order to support your delivery program? I'm thinking in terms of, do you have driver tracking? Do you, have the, do, you, do you use live maps in your stores and so forth? So maybe talk a little bit about that. So we do use live maps. Uh, it's fairly new for us using it. Um, and our business is a little bit unique in the sense that we get a lot of pre-orders. Hmm. So we, we, you know, we, we have a, a, a large catering component to our, our business. So we get a lot of orders that, um, you know, we might have a bunch of stuff that pops up on our screen at 7 a.m., um, and it might be $2,000 of business, but it all gets lot loaded in at 11, from 11 o'clock till 1230. So all these orders get jammed in there before you even open your doors. So, so we have found, again, there's no real great solution for that in terms of just ticket management. We, we do a very manual, we have a process and it works well for us, but as far as a technological piece, and we've found challenges in terms of even using live maps because a lot of these orders, they, they, they hit the POS and they can seem like they've been there for an hour when they really are just waiting, you know, because the delivery time is in the distance. So there's been a lot of that. Um, uh, and we found works around, we found workarounds that work well for us. So we're able to execute, we're able to get speed of service. So, um, so really we're just using our own stuff that, that has worked for us on that delivery front. We do have the ability to someone doesn't know where it is, we can pop up the address and they can see in the route and all that stuff um, in our POS, but we don't do any real driver tracking. And um, we know roughly based on those sort of things, how long the transaction should take, but nothing where, you know, we have seen other platforms that actually track the driver from the point of out to the cell phone and see where they are, how many stops they've made. There's, there's some of those technologies, but again, they're, they're outside of our ecosystem. So it becomes another, you know, another layer, and we, we didn't really want to bother at this point in our, in our you know, brand life cycle to, to try to get that deep right now. Right. Travis, uh, for, for you, you and I had a conversation previously. You talked about using, using toppers on the vehicles for, for tracking their GPS location. What, yeah. what, what came from that? Um, so that, that was effective for a while. Basically, it was a, a system where um, the, there was like a GPS tracker in the car topper and drivers could like check into it with a key fob in and out. Um, and that was like a live display in addition to live maps on, on like a television screen in the restaurant. Um, it, it helped in some aspects. It was kind of a pilot program. We did it two locations. Um, you could you could get more of a real time understanding as a manager when somebody was coming back or if they were kind of um, you know goofing off and not really making a direct trip there and back. Um, but overall, there was a cost to it, and then the amount of data that came back from it was kind of over the top. I mean, we're not tracking. Um, I mean, maybe on on a global scale, corporately, it would have been more advantageous. So like we had it rolled out all the way, but you have to have somebody looking at that stuff, you know, if you, right. what are you going to do? I mean, it, that tells you everything you could possibly want to know about that vehicle, right? Hard braking, speeding, everything. Um, but what are you going to do with that information and who's going to use it and review it and, and compress it and all of those things. So that kind of ended up going to the wayside and we ended up focusing more back on just the live maps data and something that, uh, you know, Nico brought up was the, the struggle of, um, you know, the deferred ticket activations and how they appear as like a late delivery on the live map display. That's a fine balance. And I totally relate to that problem that especially a bunch of lunch heavy stores have a lot of business that typically is deferred around at lunchtime or, or dinner time. And you really want to be able to see and give yourself a head start early in the day as to what's coming down the pipe. But the other side of that is being able to really utilize from above store and in store the reporting data available from uh, the live map system. So checking in how many um, how many runs each driver is taking at a time, setting limits on that, watching average out the door times, average delivery times. If you don't kind of cater to the system as it's designed to some degree, you're not going to get the good data coming out of it to be able to make those management decisions on. Okay, you know. Are we spending too much time in the kitchen getting the food out? Is it a oven time issue? Is it a um, you know overcomplication of something? Or is it road time? Is the delivery zone too big? 
or or if you're just overwhelmed at these times, you can help you with scheduling. You can help you with so many different things if you have that information. Um, so it's a again, it's a fine line battle of you know being able to see everything up front, um, but but really having to kind of stick to that system and setting security to make sure that uh, people are instructed to understand that we're watching. Make sure you're you know, dispatching your run when you leave and returning yourself when you come back. So we get solid metrics to manage from. Yeah. yeah if, the, if the solution, if the solution is is more of a problem than the original problem, that that, and I'm not suggesting that was necessarily the case, but it sounds like there was a lot of there was a lot of administration that went along with it, in order to solve something that could be solved a different way. I think what both of those stories illustrate to me is what sounds good in terms of an idea in a boardroom or on paper or in a sales pitch. You put it into a store and you'll know how it really works. And, and uh, yeah, I always feel like we're, we should be about two weeks away from finding out whether or not any of these things will actually work. Um, let's, let's go to our, our last question. And, and you talked about this at the very beginning, Nico. You talked about how you have uh, plans for growth, right? You're five locations right now, but you have this disciplined approach that seems like you're sort of, uh, you're like a coiled spring ready to, ready to explode in, in the market. Tell us a little bit about what you're looking for when you go to use, look at a new location and how heavily you rely on some of the data points that you've collected along the way. Um, as far as our, our, you know, franchise development cycle goes, and then even the corporate piece to that. So meaning like site selection, um, you know, if you're speaking towards site selection and then technologies around it, we really do a couple couple things. I mean, uh, our, we have good relationships with uh, some of our broker real estate folks that we have, again, given our brand standards to, what to look for on the site. So they have a very clear picture. Um, if someone's gonna come to them and say, I need to look for a site, what do I look for? They'll, they'll be able to guide because we've created a, a process for them of things that are important for the brand. So, um, so that's not really a technology, but that's just really our, our process, if you will. But part of that process is going to be uh, we use a company called Intelliview, and they really kind of give us a very high level look at a marketplace and they do it based on the priorities that we have. So as a brand, unlike a lot of other pizza, pizza focused brands, we really look for a central business district as a top priority. Our next thing is hospitals, schools, universities. Um, and then, you know, our third, third band of a priority is, um, you know, blue collar factories, anywhere there would be 50 or 100 or 80 people. And then lastly, it's the residential density. So we have a, we have a platform that really kind of says, okay, based on those priorities in a market, we know what the metrics kind of need to be to kind of give it a good average and say thumbs up is a good spot. So we'll run things through those sort of uh, filters, if you will. So that, that's one piece of uh, uh, a software piece, if you will, that we look at. We don't have that internal. It's an external thing that we source, but nonetheless, it goes through that software process, if you will, to kind of give us the data. Um, and that's really uh, to, to actually finding a site. That's really kind of our approach to, to looking at a site and then vetting it along with some boots on the ground stuff that really isn't technology heavy. Um, but that, that'd be really kind of our go-to piece to kind of give us that preliminary high level data so that we can start activating our next steps um, from, from that. And uh, I, I'm not sure if this was part of the question in terms of like our tech stack and activating that, but as it kind of gets into build out and new, new store opening, a lot of that stuff really for us, we really, our mandate to our team is really the owner operator franchisee really should not be, we don't want them to think about anything other than running their store at a very high level. So there's no real like, which piece do you want? Do you want to try this? You know, it, it's very much, here's our package. You know, you're investing in our brand to have this result let us let us manage this part of this process you focus in on your operational skill set and your team's depth of knowledge about operating at a high level don't worry about which wallpaper color and image like we, we take all that out of the equation for them really as a really just to again give them some structured approach to focusing in on on really what the high level priorities are so I, I, that's that's, that's okay. a great answer. I, I, I mean, I, the, the level of discipline that you bring to the site selection process, and I always think how a person does one thing is probably how they do all things. And that, but that level of, of discipline you bring to the site selection then instills trust in your in your franchisees that you have their best interests at heart, 
And then when it comes time to say, we're going to put in this pizza, the, they probably feel that you put as much research and care into the, the new product that you're launching as you did into the original site selection. So you end up with this, this sort of beautiful level of trust that's created. Yeah, I, I feel that that is true. And I appreciate, thanks, thanks for the sentiment, but I, I think we're, we're very focused on really laying a solid foundation. That's the key for everything that we do right now. It's not for where we are, it's for where we wanna be in, you know, I mean, our, our goals over the next handful of years are to onboard another 20 units and then become a national brand. So you, you, we have to, that, that's so front and center in everything that we talk about, why we act uh, is really just this complement that answer. It's not, I mean, we have to solve for today, but we also have to think about technologies, processes, procedures that, you know, can this, can this be sustainable, right? Can you, can you scale with it at least from where we are to the next step? Might not be a hundred stores, but can this thing scale for the next handful of years? That's uh, terrific. So, so that's a, it's a big piece of what we do. Travis, in terms of your new locations, tell us a little bit about what, what your brand looks for and how you're involved in that. Yeah, so for the slight for the site selection process, I'm I kind of come in after after that portion. Um, but once that's kind of established, uh, the decisions that I'm thinking about are um, how to lay out a low voltage uh, plan for the restaurant based on its footprint or concept model. Like, is there a buffet? Is there a dining area? Uh, we have like a cafe concept that requires just a little, couple of different tweaks to the plan. Um, but with that comes really trying to standardize that process a lot like Nico would say, we don't want you having to worry about picking the wallpaper. Um, and that comes from a technical aspect too. You know, I, I offer, um, uh, go ahead and take that floor plan and just totally convert it into here's all the components from the IT system that you need to work with Todd Gen and have it be a seamless thing right out of the door. Um, when we open up, you're gonna have the stations where they belong, printers where they belong, everything's gonna be labeled, it's gonna be in a nice secure cabinet, uh, the phone, audio, all of it is pre-planned for you. Um, and that's really what I've spent a lot of time trying to uh, design that system and make sure I'm working with general contractors and electricians and any subcontractors who would be working on any of this and constantly reviewing their work. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other part of that is, you know, especially at locations that are further away or outside of the immediate region, um, of the technology package that we're pushing to the store, making sure that all the training staff, consulting staff, um, and, and even when I'm on site to, to go visit, that everyone clearly understands how to utilize the technology that's deployed. I mean, you can have a new franchisee, franchisee come into the system and tell them, all right, well, you know, here's all these great things I'm doing for you, but if you open up and they have no idea how to utilize any of it, it really um, takes away from the value of it. Um, so, making sure that every single piece of that puzzle is like documented out there. There's access to, you know, relearn those things. And because as you approach a store opening, there's so much going on. Um, and sometimes when you go through training session after training session, you might forget what we talked about. Right. And how do I guide you to the right resources to make sure that of all aspects with, you know, Speedline has a great insight website that has videos and educational stuff. Um, we have an in internet website that has our standard operating procedures and a whole bunch of other helpful resources that really help drive home those concepts. So, no, it's very good. I want to open this up to questions. So we have some questions that have already have already started to come in. Uh, let's start off with this one. Uh, I'm curious, what are you guys thinking about AI-based, artificial intelligence-based ordering experiences? Travis, have you looked at this at all? I have a little bit. Um, and some of them are getting pretty good. When they first were coming around, they have, I didn't see that there was a lot of accuracy in it and it could be kind of complex to use at times. Um, there's the whole integration portion of it too, where you know it might be great at understanding what you're saying or asking for, but when it comes down to integrating with the point of sale and having that mapping on that product's back end working correctly, that's a whole another element to this. So understanding what the consumer wants is part of it, but interacting with, you know, the, the API on sending that information down correctly with the correct um, PLUs or SKUs or whatever you want to call them, uh, that, that's definitely a battle to overcome in that section of the ordering industry, I think. Uh, but the AI is, is definitely coming along. Nico, you used a phrase earlier, you said you like to be open to the noise. 
So have you have you listened to the noise of AI at all? I have. Um, I I don't think it's ready for prime time, but I think as a brand, um, we want to be aware of it and sort of where it's at in its development cycle and how we might. I mean, it's for, for us, we're, we're not big enough, I think, to even think about worrying about it, because even if we wanted to adopt it, I'm sure there is so much time, resources, finances that would need to go in there to make it work for a brand of our size, which would not be, you know, economical, really. But Sure. But I think it's just definitely kind of keeping it there. You know, um, there, it's, it's definitely uh, it's definitely a conversation that I've heard many, many times over, especially as we're starting to think about all this, you know, like the Alexas of the world and the series and, and kind of how when you ask questions, you kind of move around the search engines even, right? You're, you're just asking, you know, order, where's the best pizza place? I mean, there's a lot of stuff to start thinking about how you build a brand so that your brand name becomes, I, I want a Rascal House pizza, as opposed to just a pizza. Um, sure. So all that stuff, I mean, we, we think about that stuff and how it relates and how does it impact our business long-term. And, you know, some of the big boys I, uh, that are technology companies first, like the Domino's of the world, I think, you know, they're, they're heavily uh, engaged. So you just kind of follow their lead, see what they're doing, um, let them sort of spend their resources to kind of, you know, show us uh, the way, if you will, uh, kind of how that technology is going, but yeah. So that's interesting stuff. Mark Cuban made an interesting comment uh, talking about artificial intelligence. And his comment was the first trillionaire will be created as a result of AI. Someone who develops uh, is, in, is in the world of developing AI solutions. And that we as business leaders owe it to ourselves to be on top of what's going on in AI. And if we're not, and it's great to hear both you guys are, are listening to that, because if you're not, his comment was that you're like a person who in 1995 or 2000 said, I'm not sure if this internet thing is going to stick, right? And, and, and we, want, we want to be paying attention to what's going on with that. Um, have you, either of you used text or phone-based AI? So like a text-based ordering where a person tries to, to do that, have you done that as a consumer first and foremost, Travis? Yeah, and that when this question popped up, that was like one of the first things I thought of. Um, and and it, it's getting better. It's not placing the order. There's hybrid models that are uh, emerging too, where you can, you know, say, "Hey, I want this," and it it adds it to cart, sends you a link, and drives you back to the ordering page, which I do kind of enjoy for now because it's using the same um, backend technology to get it down to the store level um, versus a whole other system of um, uh, basically relying on an outside party to, to get it there. I, I, I just fear that uh, what happens when the college student at 2.30 a.m. is trying to text their order into us and might, might not get it right, right? Or, or people who may, maybe uh, English is a second language or, or, you know, I guess you could solve that problem, but um, there's a lot of situations where people don't text very clearly and I really sure. want the guests to have a great experience. So I, I, I worry that it's going to transpose into something that it's not and end up creating more problems than benefit. No, it's fair. Benefit it's it fair. speeds it up, but um, yeah. you know, there could be a lot of consequences for it as well. Uh, Nico, uh, do you use consultants to make any of your decisions uh, or to help you help guide you through that process? Um, we do. We do use consultants, definitely on the franchising side, as we are building infrastructure for franchise development and our sales team and our lead generation pipeline, you know, things like that. So we we'll try, try to find um, experts in the disciplines that are needed for that. Um, and that does spill over into, you know, again, our food vendor uh, distribution, you know, I'll, I'll talk to those guys too, as it relates to different platforms uh, for looking at you know, so stuff like software. So I, I tend to be pretty, uh, pr pretty open to, to asking people, hey, what do you use? Have you used it? Especially if they've been, if they're interacting in the food space. So, um, so yeah, we will, we'll, we do have some consultative stuff that we do. But again, that's mostly facing on the franchise development side, and franchise expansion side, not so much heavy operational um, side, although some of those guys are come from brands that were, they were in ops. So they do spill over a little bit with some questions and best practices, but fundamentally, I wouldn't say we use too much on the consultative side for restaurant operations, mostly on the uh, 
franchise uh, franchise side of our company. Great. I've got time for one last question here, um, and, and this is was addressed to to Travis. You mentioned the idea of the toppers on the car, uh, and the question was: so was that viewed as a mistake, or was that viewed as an experiment internally? Ah. Uh... I think that's a tough question. Um, sometimes depends I who, it as, depends who you ask. Yeah, I think I think it's both, really. I think it was an experiment that maybe turned to a mistake. It 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 was an experiment that was positive and exciting in the beginning. Um, it had some value, so it wasn't just right. You know, it wasn't just something to completely write off for futures, but it also. Where it, where it became a mistake is where it kind of lingered away. And, you know, it was like, oh, here's this thing that we're doing. But it was hard to keep people on top of doing it and using it and then reviewing that information. So that's where it kind of became a mistake. We, we maybe held on a little bit longer than we should have. Um, but it's still a really cool idea. It still had a lot of value if somebody wanted to really, you know, dive in and really focus on it. But I... Are there other things in the industry that has more value than that right now in my book? Yes. So that, I think the mistake is the, the time to realize uh, we're at a barrier. Great. Excellent. Uh, Nico Frangos from Rascal House, Travis Miller from Cottage Inn. I appreciate your time today. Thank you for sharing your, your experiences with us. It's exciting to hear what you guys are doing. And uh, I, I think that uh, our, our audience will appreciate it as well. So thank you very much. And thank you to Pizza Marketplace for putting together this, this webinar. It's always appreciated. And uh, to everybody out there, stay safe. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us.